Lizzie Borden took an axe, gave her mother 40 wax. When she saw what she had done, gave her father 41. Like that. (laughs) Welcome to the Lizzie Borden Podcast, Episode 9. The Lizzie Borden Podcast is a Nine Muses Books production. This is the only podcast devoted to Lizzie Borden and the Borden murders of 1892. Episode 9, A Lizzie Borden Primer, Part 4. Today on the Lizzie Borden Podcast, we'll be revisiting and completing the Lizzie Borden Primer. I'll be talking with Sarah Miller, author of The Borden Murders, Lizzie Borden and the Trial of the Century. Sarah has been with us since the beginning of the Primer. Part 1 focused on Lizzie's life before the murders, Part 2 covered the crime and the investigation, and Part 3 discussed the murder trial that ended in her acquittal. Part 4 is called the Maplecroft Years because it covers those three decades that Lizzie Borden resided in her Fall River Highlands home, Maplecroft. Originally, not much was known about these years. They were shrouded in legend and rumors of scandal. But a recent book, Parallel Lives, A Social History of Lizzie A. Borden and Her Fall River, published by the Fall River Historical Society, illuminated what was previously a very private life. Before we begin, I want to inform our listeners that the next podcast will have an interview with Michael Mardens and Dennis Bennett, the authors of Parallel Lives and the curators of the Fall River Historical Society. It will be an exciting show, and I hope you can join us. Also in the works is a radio play based on the Lizzie Borden girl detective short story, The Agitated Elocutionist, being produced by Nine Muses Books exclusively for the Lizzie Borden podcast, and it will be available in February. As we enter the 125th year since the unsolved murders of Andrew and Abby Borden, we have more reason than ever to ponder the details of Lizzie Borden's life, hunting for clues, trying to sort out who she was as a person, whether she was capable of such a crime, and whether her story is one of tragedy or infamy. We're hoping this installment of the Lizzie Borden Primer will give you much to contemplate and lay the groundwork for further exploration of this fascinating Victorian age New England woman. Well, Sarah, welcome back to the podcast. Thanks. It's pretty super to be back. Yeah, this is your uh, fifth time, I believe. Yeah, you've joined us once when we discussed your book, The Borden Murders, Lizzie Borden and the Trial of the Century. Then you came back three times to help us with the Lizzie Borden primer. Time flies. Yeah, just yesterday. It was 1905. (laughs) (laughs) Well, we left off just when Lizzie Borden was acquitted from her trial. And today we're going to cover what we call the Maplecroft years, because these were the years after her trial when she moved into her home on French Street, out of the murder house on Second Street, and spent as many years in that house, essentially, as she lived before the murders. So this is a major part of her life, the whole second half of her life. I just want to tell the, the listeners that the two books that Sarah and I have sourced our material from for this episode have been Lizzie Borden Past and Present by Len Rebello, a book that unfortunately is out of print right now, but you may be able to snag a copy of it on eBay. And the other book, equally important, if not more so, is Parallel Lives, the book by the Fall River Historical Society, Michael Mardens and Dennis Benet are the authors of that book, which came out about five years ago. These two books are essential texts for anyone who really wants to cast away all the myths and legends and and nonsense that has accreted around the Lizzie Borden case and Lizzie Borden herself and get at the actual historical facts of what we know. So we're going to pick up in 1893, essentially June 20th, when Lizzie Borden is acquitted in the courtroom, when she actually was escorted from the courtroom after the verdict of not guilty was brought in. Yep, not guilty, as opposed to innocent, which 
probably is kind of the backbone of Lizzie's troubles over the next 30 years is that distinction. Right, exactly. So Lizzie Borden is escorted from the courtroom after the verdict of not guilty is brought in. She actually doesn't go home to 92 Second Street. She goes to the home of Charles J. Holmes on 67 Pine Street. Now, this is the reason why when you go to Fall River on a Sunday afternoon, you're going to see a bunch of very strange people hanging out outside 67 Pine Street taking photographs. <laughs> <laughs> because every uh, every last step that she took that we know about is uh, tracked by modern day enthusiasts. I'm a little ashamed I didn't go there when I was in Fall River. <laughs> I was on a tight schedule. <laughs> yeah, I passed by in a car. <laughs> Shelly Dizek like uh, drove me by in a car, and she said, "Oh, there's uh, the Pine Street house," and that was it. <laughs> She actually didn't get to 92 Second Street until the next morning, where she was greeted with a new housekeeper, Harriet. That's an interesting concept. It's not Bridget. It's Harriet. We're so used yeah, to hearing... Bridget was kind of done. <laughs> <laughs> she was hiding. I don't know if we know anything about Harriet or how long she even stayed I, there. I can't think of anything, no. But I mean, and I had actually forgotten that piece of it. And, and I, I read that and went, oh, well, of course. I mean, Bridget was the, the prosecution star witness. You <laughs> And she was terrified of that place. She wasn't going to go back there. Yeah, she eventually wound up back in uh, Minnesota. Yeah. Where she married, Bridget Sullivan married a man named Sullivan. I'm Sullivan. Oh, wait, it was Montana. Oh, Montana, it was sorry. Away. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, she married a man named Sullivan, so she didn't have to change her monograms <laughs> on her handkerchiefs. Now, I wasn't surprised to find that 2,000 people were outside 92 Second Street. I forgot the source on that number, but it was pretty well documented by Lynn Rebello. Yeah. Uh, the other thing was that there was a band outside the house playing Old Lang Syne. That's a little detail that if they ever make a movie about this case, you know, that has to be included. That's very strange. Yeah. So L Lizzie had been in jail for 10 months before her trial. So this was uh, quite an ordeal for her. She had actually narrowly escaped the gallows. And if not the gallows, uh, being incarcerated in an insane asylum. And that was the first thing she wanted to do was to go back to, to the old place, I think is what she called it, which to us sounds strange. I mean, that's where your parents were murdered, but it was still home. Yeah, better that than a prison cell with a, a death sentence hanging over you. Yeah. We, we find out that Marshall Hilliard was getting hate mail. There were people were calling out for Lizzie to be beheaded. And as you, typical in cases like this, she was getting marriage proposals. Totally normal, right? <laughs> <laughs> and um, in, in some state election, uh, someone actually wrote her in for attorney general. Jeez. <laughs> this, is, this is what happens. Yeah, yeah. People just get goofy. Especially if you study the lives of serial killers, um, you find out that they get marriage proposals and they get strange followings. Well, and, you know, in a town where there were so many Bordens, it, but Lizzie was so infamous suddenly that there's that story of somebody spotting a trunk um, at the rail station just marked L. Borden. It was not her trunk, but people literally swarmed. They came running to see this trunk that they thought belonged to Lizzie Borden, who had gotten away with murder. It's a weird form of celebrity. And Lizzie was actually uh, given offers to appear on the stage. And poor Reverend Jubb. Remember Reverend Jubb? Oh yeah, yeah. He went on a lecture tour, and it had nothing to it had nothing to do with the Bordens. But it didn't matter, did it? Because he was Reverend Job. <laughs> yeah, everywhere he went, the theaters were billing him as Lizzie Borden's pastor. Yeah, that's and all you need. So in, instead of leaving town, Lizzie stayed in Fall River. Yeah, she assumed that she was going to return to some sort of normal life. Yeah, it was kind of naive. There's a quote, I think the, it was a columnist, Joe Howard, who quoted her as saying, if any of my old friends sees fit to ignore me, I shall, I suppose, be compelled to drop them. Like, <laughs> yeah. she still thought she would have control over that, which was just completely not the case. And people were snubbing her left and right. I mean, she went to yeah. attend church, but no one sat near her pew, and she was given the cold shoulder even by people who had supported her during the trial. Well, yeah, and that, that church snub is extra hard because those, you know, it, it's not like, you know, nowadays where I live anyway, you just, you walk into church and maybe you sit into the pew where you kind of usually sit. If somebody's there, you sit somewhere else. These were rented pews. You paid for your family seat. Yes. So for people to choose a different one, to vacate their pew because it was near Lizzie Borden, that was really deliberate. 
and her and Emma trying to live a normal life. They were actually experiencing a weird form of stalking where everywhere they went, uh, people were staring and gossiping wherever they shopped. Oh, yeah, the, the stores, the businesses were just empty into the street with spectators if they saw the Bordens walking up the street. Yeah, in newspapers, they were actually printing like where the Borden sisters had been seen and what they could possibly be doing, especially <laughs> especially when they were shopping for the house on French Street. They looked yeah. at various houses, and the different houses that they were looking at, you know, people would, crowds would go and stare at that house, mm-hmm. even if the Borden sisters didn't buy it. Yeah. But do you want to tell us something about Andrew's estate and where the money went and why the sisters got the money and what happened there? Yeah, the um, the estate was split between Emma and Lizzie. Emma, in fact, paid half of Lizzie's court bill. She paid half of the lawyer's fees because she felt it was her duty. None of Mr. Borden's money went to any of his wife's remaining relatives because they had established in court quite certainly that Mrs. Borden had died first. But Mrs. Borden's estate is, is interesting, that uh, Emma and Lizzie, I don't know the, the proper term forwarded isn't quite right, but you know they, they gave all of that money that was their stepmother's to her, I think, what was it, her half-sister? Yeah, Sarah Whitehead is her half-sister. Yeah, Bertie, they called her. They kept none of that. It was $4,000. It was, I mean, if I'm going to be a little snotty about it. It was chump change. But after all the animosity that the prosecution tried to paint between those two families, it would not have been surprising if the Borden sisters had kept Mrs. Borden's estate because they were entitled to it. Mrs. Borden's money went to Mr. Borden for that 90 minutes or whatever that he outlived her. So legally speaking, the and Emma and Lizzie were under no obligation to turn that money over to Mrs. Borden's heirs, but they did. And Andrew's estate, uh, the numbers vary, but Len Ribello's estimate in his book is that it came to roughly $350,000, which is about $60 million It's big money. In 1996 dollars. 1996 is when he wrote the book. So, it, yeah, $60 million was in, now in the hands of Lizzie and Emma Borden. And there are people who will say that, you know, they... Essentially, they went shopping with it, and, and, and in their minds, that proved, and in Fall River's mind at the time, that proved to them that it had been you know, a crime just based on greed. And hmm, I don't entirely agree with that, but I, I see there is a certain logic there that I can't argue with. Well, one of the things that they shopped for was a house. Uh, they certainly weren't going to stand for that little cheese box down on 2nd Street anymore. <laughs> No, and you know, Emma had scrubbed the bloodstains off the walls, but, you know, it's, it's hard to weigh those two things. It's known that they wanted a more comfortable, fashionable residence, and that could be seen as a motive for the murder. On the other hand, if Lizzie was not, in fact, guilty, um, would you want to stay in the house where your parents had been murdered by someone else? Correct. So they, they got a house of their own, and they shopped around. At the time that they found the house on French Street, the, the street number was 7, 7 French Street. It was later changed to 306 French Street. Now, immediately, photographers were starting to take photographs of the house and selling them. They were selling them to tourists and to, to gawkers. Uh, they also, the, the houses that the Borden sisters looked at that they passed on were being photographed. And those, photo- those photographs are being sold. And the rumor has it that those photographs were half price because the Borden sisters didn't actually buy the houses. But that's how, that's how nuts things were, the fascination with these people. And the news headlines were funny because they were clearly just trying to milk it, you know, whatever little drops were left in that story. <clears throat> Excuse me, when Lizzie, like, went back on the train to the jail to thank the matron and the mm, her husband, I can't remember the man's title, the jail keeper, for being kind to her. The newspaper headline was something like, you know, Lizzie Borden returns to jail like she'd been reincarcerated. They were casting this totally different meaning on everything she did in order to, to pull the readers, to make it sound like the story was alive again, when really they were just twisting things. It, they were the tabloids of their time. Yeah. So they buy this house on French Street, and it's a very large. It's it's a large house compared to what it's, they were yeah, coming from. It's about what five hundred square feet larger. I mean, it's not huge compared to the other one, but it's it's a significant difference. Yeah. I it uh, uh, in urban legend, it's been turned into a mansion, but 
it, oh, certainly yeah. there were mansions in Fall River. There was like Interlochen where Spencer Borden lived on, on the pond and that. Well, and some of the newspaper coverage had even called the, the house on 2nd Street a mansion. And I don't know if that was just misinformed or if they used the word differently at that time or if they thought that qualified. Yeah, well, the, the, uh, the Boston Daily Advertiser at the time wrote, and I quote, It is not an expensive nor luxurious house. $5,000 would go a long way towards building another like it. But that, that's a little deceptive. It is, it is a, a luxurious house. I mean, it has a lot of the amenities that had eluded the Bordens on 2nd Street. Very well appointed. Yeah, I have a list here. It, it's a Queen Anne home with a stone foundation, two and a half stories, sided in clapboard and shingle. It's got a modern floor plan. It's got high ceilings, finished woodwork, parquet floors, built-in hallway benches, stained glass windows, oak doors and archways, decorative mantelpieces, damask-covered table sets, fine silverware and monogram china, embossed ceilings, closet space. Can you imagine having closets for the first time? Well, actually, they had closets on 2nd Street, but these, this is, these are, are real closets. And, oh, and a library. A library. A whole room. A whole room just for, for being alive. And bathrooms. I'm sure they loved the bathrooms when they got in there. They one, uh, one journalist said at the time they had bought a house on the hill in the very center of aristocracy. Because up here on the hill, unlike 2nd Street, were the branches of the Borden family who were quite affluent, like the Jefferson Bordens and the Richard Borden branches. So they, were now, they now had all the conveniences of the modern age. Yeah, they were very comfortable up there. It wasn't, I mean, it wasn't a showy house, I would say. Um, it wasn't ostentatious, but it, it's quite clear that Lizzie had a somewhat expensive taste. She she liked nice things. She bought the best that was available without, you know, being, I, in my opinion, really over the top, which, again, for some people, points toward greed and guilt. Well, I wouldn't argue with that, but there's also the element of she now has the money to buy what she wants to buy without her father putting curtailing their uh, putting a, a cap or a limit on their on their lifestyle. And you know, even if he'd never really said if he if there was no like monetary line that he said you must not cross this dollar amount, just living with a man who was very frugal and who was in charge and who was providing for you, I think it would be difficult to spend more than a certain amount just in your own mind. It wouldn't feel right if you were in that situation. You, you couldn't be extravagant even if you technically had the means. Because, I mean, Lizzie had like seven seventy grand in today's dollars in her bank account at the time of the murder. So it, it wasn't like, you know, she was just, you know, rubbing a couple pennies together every week. She, she had means, but for whatever reason... She, she didn't spend until afterward. And Andrew Borden had been born in 1822, and he had uh, he was a congregationist on top of that, which meant that he did have a bit of a frugal mind. And you know, he I'm sure 92 Second Street itself was a step up from what he had grown up with. So Maplecroft was a big achievement for these sisters, at least what Lizzie self-identified with for the rest of her life. At this point, I want to throw in the name Charles Cook. Do you want to do you want to tell us who Charles Cook is? He was their business manager, essentially. I would say he managed their their real estate, their investment. I would say, as Andrew Jennings had been to Mr. Borden, essentially Charles Cook was to the Borden sisters. He was something of an advisor and and so forth. Yes, and, and we found out through Parallel Lives that he was the son of the man who ran the business, Shaw and Cook, who were dealers in stoves, plumbing, and tinware. And their store was on South Main Street, literally right next to Andrew Borden's Borden and Almy's. And Lizzie had grown up with his sister, Charlotte, who she called Lottie. So clearly this was a friendship that lasted. Uh, we presume that if she was so intimately involved with Charles Cook and she had been best friends with his sister Lottie when she was a, a girl, then her friendship with Lottie may have lasted for the rest of her life. Right. So, I mean, clearly she trusted the family in general and, and Mr. Cook in particular. Yeah. And Mr. Cook also, he intervened or mediated between Lizzie and Emma and their, their clients, their tenants, 
people they were doing business with. It's interesting that he maintained that relationship. I mean, granted that it was a business relationship, I'm sure he was paid well for his service. But in a town like Fall River, as considering its attitude toward Lizzie Borden, that he maintained that relationship when other people maintained no relationship with her whatsoever, be it business or friendship. He appears to have done both. But I was reading Parallel Lives, and there was an incident where Lizzie tried to talk directly to a tenant. Probably a mistake. <laughs> she was very, un- yeah, she was very uncomfortable. She made a lot of mistakes. She got emotional about things. And she basically ended up saying, this is why I don't like dealing directly. Yeah, she was not eloquent. I mean, that that's probably part of why she didn't get on the stand at the trial. She just, she did not speak well. And she kept writing little notes to her neighbors saying, uh, you're... <laughs> Your bird yeah. or your dog or, or, or keeping me up at night or in yeah. or while I'm sitting on my piazza, I, I, uh, <laughs> I'm distracted by the barking of your dog. Please do something about <laughs> this. just these sort of <laughs> awkward, tactless. I mean, they don't come off to me as mean-spirited, but yeah, you're like, oh, Lizzie, don't. <laughs> you know what? Don't. It's like Liz- Lizzie Borden's equivalent of tweeting on Twitter at three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> 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 I'm sure her neighbors, on top of thinking that they live next to a, a patricidal woman, uh, right? <laughs> here she is bothering them about their, their birds. And yeah, the bird is tweeting too loud. Please make it stop. I mean, like, what did she think they were going to do? <laughs> <laughs> so I think one, one way that we could assess how Lizzie interacted with people and what her frame of mind was in this period right after buying Maplecroft is her relationship with the Women's Christian Temperance Union. Now, they had a seven-year lease in the A.J. Borden building, which was her father's office building on South Main Street and Anawan Street. And the president of the Fall River Women's Christian Temperance Union wrote, and this is after Lizzie had given her some grief, Miss Lizzie Borden is a physical wreck and is morbidly sensitive, imagining a thousand and one slights where none were ever dreamed of. Her sister Emma has also grown strangely reticent. This, this was an interview in the Fall River Globe. The reference point for this is that Lizzie had been involved in the Women's Christian Temperance Union in Fall River. In fact, I believe she had been their secretary at one point. When she perceived her being slighted by them on the street to a significant degree, she basically tried to break the lease, reduce it from seven year to uh, uh, either one year or three year. I think she let them run out a three year lease, but she was trying to get them out of the building. And I can imagine that, yes, she was perhaps overly sensitive, but I think not without just cause. I mean, when when people get up out of their family pews and turn their backs on you on Sunday morning, yeah, you know, you're, you're going to look at people differently. You're going to wonder what they're thinking when they turn aside. Is it because something caught their attention elsewhere or because they're literally looking away from you? I don't know how she could properly interpret people's reactions after that. Yeah, it may have been a combination of the way she was really being treated in a very slighted way and also her suffering from post-traumatic shock from her whole experience, being overly sensitive to things. The Taunton Daily Gazette wrote, If Miss Lizzie Borden attempts to square with all who gave her the cold shoulder in Fall River, she will not lack of occupation the rest of her days. Yeah, you know, there's, there's something to her feelings, clearly, because other people could see it. Now, she did have some positive experiences when she left. I mean, she did start traveling again. She went to the Chicago World's Fair. Yeah. The World's <laughs> Columbian Exposition. Can you imagine? And why does that make us laugh and go, wow, but it does. Said, Wait, Lizzie <laughs> Borden went to the fair? She sure did. <laughs> well, if you read about this fair, my God, I saw a documentary that was on Netflix about the fair. And for the first time, I realized the scope of it, the size of it. It was called the White City. They built an entire city just for the fair. This may not mean much to a modern audience, but these structures like the Liberal Arts Building, the the Electricity Building, the electric launches on the Lagoon, the Midway, the Turkish Theater. The Turkish Theater had scandalized the fair by having what they called hoochie-coochie dances. (laughs) So we may have Lizzie Borden like in a tent watching hoochie-coochie dances. (laughs) And the Ferris wheel. And the Ferris wheel with the largest, yeah. the largest, stri- I mean, the Ferris wheel was competing with the Eiffel Tower, which had just been premiered in, in Paris. Right. And it was the first of its kind. It was actually built by Mr. Ferris. Yeah. 
And those cars, you know, we're used to sitting, what, like four, maybe six people in a car on a Ferris wheel. These things that could hold like 20, 30 people. Oh, yeah. They were like little rooms suspended on this giant wheel. Well, I read that 2,160 people at a time could be on the wheel. Wow. Yeah. That's crazy. And it was 264 feet high. So this may have been the most eye-opening and exhilarating moment of Lizzie's life outside of her world tour in Europe several years earlier. And I would think, I think you're right, because I mean, it's one thing to just go on a pleasure trip, you know, when you're a young woman. Let's go see the world. But after having gone through what she went through, yeah. and then to go to the World's Fair, I, I think is something else entirely. Yeah, and this was a true World's Fair, not, not like the Walt Disney commercialism of the 1964 <laughs> one that I grew up with. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. This was a true World's Fair where uh, they, they did have representatives of all the nations that Lizzie had gone on the Grand Tour to. And um, she would have seen like massive displays of electricity for the first time. I mean, lighting up parts of Fall River with electricity is impressive enough, but imagine what they did at the fair with the exhibitions. Oh, and also, H.H. H. Holmes, the serial killer, was at work. Yeah. <laughs> it's like so much converges at that <laughs> fair at once. It's, just, it's unreal. An interesting novel could come out of a mashup between Lizzie Borden and H.H. <laughs> H. Holmes. Yeah. <laughs> that, uh, that's something that, to something that pitch, you know, to a Hollywood studio, maybe. So she tra- she would travel, and she would travel under an assumed name. I, I, I'm amused by the name Mary Smith Borden that she used at various <laughs> times. Checking into a hotel, what's your name? Smith. Smith. Smith, Smith. Borden. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you wonder, like, how did she get around unrecognized? But if you've seen the newspaper sketches, there is such a wide variety, and some of them are just funny. They bear no resemblance whatever to her. So yeah, you know, she could have gone around. And if she puts on a big hat and she's traveling with yeah. some people, you know, they I'm sure she could get away with it. There is that that her eyes are unmistakable, but I think they had sunglasses back then. <laughs> uh, but you know, if you're not staring into the lens of a camera, are your eyes really that unmistakable? I don't know. You know, in a giant crowd of people, yeah. Yeah, that famous photo of her behind the chair, I think we, we, we're so taken with it because she's staring right at the camera, and it's, it's shocking. Yeah, people just didn't do that at the time. Emma didn't do that. You look at Emma's photos, and she's just sort of, you know, demure and ladylike like you're supposed to be, and Lily just looks right at you. And yeah. even today, we look at those photos and go, ooh, she's, she's looking right at me. Very early on, when I first heard of Lizzie Borden and I saw that photo, I looked at that photo and said, she did it. She did it. She did it. <laughs> She's crazy. That's a crazy woman. <laughs> Actually, I was seven years I old. I don't know. If I, have I done this like thought experiment with you before? If, if somebody gave you a picture of Abraham Lincoln and you'd never seen the man before and knew nothing about him. Oh, yeah. And you, you looked at his messy hair and his beady little eyes and his sticky out ears. And then I told you, you know, he was known to wrestle with melancholy and he was very handy with an axe. What would you think of that man? <laughs> He's a funny looking dude and yeah, and he's if if you forget everything good you know about him and you just you know, if you think, Okay, what if what if this man was known to have been in the vicinity of ninety two Second Street yeah. in August of eighteen ninety two, you'd go, yeah, you should probably investigate that guy, you know. He had an alibi though. He had been dead for twenty eight years uh, or something. I while. suppose that's Whatever. pretty solid. Well, uh yeah, I, I have a I have a strange disturbed feeling around very tall men with small heads <laughs> i don't know why <laughs> you have a lincoln complex i don't know <laughs> <laughs> but anyway she did have a setback very shortly after that within a couple of years we call it the tilden thurber incident yeah february 1897 this is a, a jeweler in providence rhode island lizzie borden had visited their shop and the rumor has it that after she left the shop, two items were missing from their inventory. These were two painted porcelains. It's unclear whether that's true or not. Yeah, there are variations of this story. There's a couple that, well, there's like another version that itself has two variations. I think there's one where nothing is noticed missing, but a woman comes in, it's either to have a, a painted porcelain piece um, framed or to have it repaired. That's not clear which is true. It depends on which newspaper you read. And then that's when they say, wait a minute, 
we we sold this. I mean, we carried this, but we didn't sell, sell it. This this is missing, and nobody realized. And the woman says, "Oh, it was a gift from Lizzie Borden." And then the story just takes off from there. Yeah, and the belief, we believe that an, an arrest warrant was issued by the Providence Chief yeah. of Police, which was never served. He wouldn't confirm. Did he confirm or deny? I don't remember. Either way, a warrant was never served, but an investigator was dispatched to Fall River to talk to Lizzie Borden about this, the second painting, which was still in her possession. And she claimed to have bought them for $16 each, even though at the gallery they were valued at $100 a piece. So something odd was going on. Yes, yeah, something. And, and the, the speed with which the story disappears from the papers is intriguing also, because you get all these conflicting reports. Well, not even, I make it sound like there's a great many. There's like maybe three or four. And then suddenly it's gone. Like, what just happened? Did that really happen? Or was that all a great big mistake that someone was advised to stop talking about? So the bottom line is that something happened after Lizzie Borden visited Tilden Thurber. And it may have been a shoplifting attempt. It may have been a misunderstanding. It may have been that she did buy the porcelains and they weren't properly invoiced. And the woman who Lizzie Borden gave one of the porcelains to brought it back to Tilden Thurber for repair. And it was believed that Lizzie Borden had shoplifted them. But either way, after the whole incident passed out of the press, uh, I'm not sure how long, how far into the future this was, but a piece of paper did get produced at one point. Which, had, which was typewritten on a typewriter, and it, it said, unfair means force my signature admitting the act of August 4th, 1892 is mine alone, and then a signature underneath it, Lisbeth A. Borden. Now, it's believed by some people that she was blackmailed, that they said that we're going to go public with this and we're going to indict you for these shopliftings unless you sign a confession to the murders of 1892. The premise being that a woman who had sat in jail for 10 months would then confess over a couple hundred dollars worth of porcelain. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. She did say unfair means, force my signature. (laughs) But but there's a problem with this piece of paper. This incident occurred in 1897, and she signs it Lisbeth A. Borden. And she didn't call herself Lisbeth until a couple of years later. Yeah, 19 aught something. And it, it seems reasonably clear that this was a hoax. Was that perpetuated at the time, or did it come out many years later? It came out a few years later. It, it's considered a hoax. Yeah. By it's, everybody. It's, certainly a hoax. it's considered a hoax by everybody but Frank Sparring, <laughs> who wrote the book Lizzie, a book not to read, dear listeners. Do not, it is toxic. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It really is. Um, but it appears that that signature, to my eye anyway, looks like it very well could have been lifted from her will, which would you know mean that somebody had put it together probably at, at the very earliest in the late 1920s. That sounds plausible. Now, I wouldn't exactly call this a scandal. It seemed to be a scandal later on, but the next so-called scandal was the Nance O'Neill affair. The background to it is that Lizzie Borden loved the theater. Very much, yeah. Sometimes two performances in a day. She actually grew up around the corner from the Academy Building on South Main Street, which was a major center for the arts in Fall River. And you're right, she would travel to Boston and New York, and she would see up to two performances a day, the matinee and the evening performances. And she became fascinated with an actress named Nance O'Neill. Mm-hmm. Most who, of the country was fascinated, or the world, really, with, with Nance O'Neill at the time. She was a hot property at that point. She was the thing. I mean, there's there's newspaper reports, I think, as far away as, like, New Zealand, of people splitting the seams of their gloves when they applauded so vigorously for this actress. Well, yes, to Lizzie Borden's benefit, she came to Boston, and she played in Boston to great fanfare, and she played the great tragic roles, Lady Macbeth, Camille, Magda, the Hedda Gabler. Uh, she also did light comedy, but she was best known for these heavy, tragic roles, And Lizzie would go to Boston to see her and poignantly sent her flowers and a calling card and tried to get to see her backstage. Lizzie was a (laughs) fangirl. Yeah. Yeah, she was uh, she was infatuated with her. Now, of course, Nance O'Neill was known for playing these dark, dark, intense characters like Lady Macbeth. We don't know what Lizzie thought of the play Macbeth. (laughs) Um, I thought Hamlet would probably be a better play for Lizzie, but (laughs) 
Well, and it's, it's fun to imagine, you know, what did Nance O'Neill think when the calling card from Elizabeth Borden came? Although Nance O'Neill said she didn't realize that that, that was the, the very same Lizzie Borden. But you, you almost have to question that. Was she yeah. just playing that up for the, the publicity? Maybe. It, it's possible. Uh, I'll get into that in a minute, because uh, when Parallel Lives came out, they tackled the issue of Lizzie and Nance, and they uh, they really kind of gave a slightly different alternative narrative to the ones that were peddled in a lot of the true crime books that claim that Lizzie Borden had had uh, an affair with Nance O'Neill that lasted for a few years. And that affair was so shocking to Emma Borden that it drove Emma Borden from her own house. Yeah. But the story they tell in Parallel Lives is slightly more plausible and I think more human and more complicated. Yeah. Now, Nance, I wanted to start with a quote from Nance that – uh, says, this is a composite of different quotes from different interviews. But Nance remembers Lizzie as, quote, quiet, reserved, frail, little old-fashioned gentlewoman, exceedingly well-read, conversant with the best literature, and she spoke interestingly of her travels abroad. I felt a great sympathy for her. She was always so alone. We were like ships that pass in the night and speak to each other only in passing. This sounds plausible. This sounds like this is how Nance O'Neill could have seen Lizzie Borden. Well, and some of what she says is consistent with how other people had described Lizzie as being, she was well-read, she was a good conversationalist. She may not have been good at speaking publicly, formally, you know, with tenants and so forth, but just with, with friends and relatives. And uh, Lizzie took to her like a fish to water. I mean, she courted her. She really courted her. She threw a party for her at Maplecroft. Uh, the party was, uh, by all accounts, that she had a caterer. She imported palm trees. Palm trees, yeah, music. Yeah, she had a whole orchestra, and uh, yeah. it went on for a while. And, uh, and it was the whole company, wasn't it? The whole yeah, she invited the whole cast of that show. Yeah, the whole cast. Uh, Victoria Lincoln, who who was a writer who grew up in Fall River and wrote a book about Lizzie Borden, wrote, That night Emma left. <laughs> now, I'm not quite sure if it was as, as, as clean as a whistle like that, but, uh, um, no, I don't think so. but uh, this is around the time that Emma Borden leaves Maplecroft, which we'll get to in a minute. Yeah, we, we can't. There's no way around the fact that it, it's, it appears quite clear that Nancy O'Neill was the last straw, but I don't believe that she was the root of what caused that breach between Emma and Lizzie. Right, right. There may have been multiple causes for it, which we'll get to. Now, uh, Nance O'Neill had a country place up in Tingsboro, Massachusetts, and uh, uh, she had a party up there, and that party was wilder. It lasted for a week, and it was reported to have been financed by Lizzie. That's the rumor. And to be fair, I've never seen anything that contradicts that rumor. I don't know how you would go about proving it, but it, it seems possible to me. I mean, Lizzie enjoyed spoiling people that she was fond of it, it she could very well have done that yes she was smitten with her they they wrote letters to each other the letters had little cute pen names and this is where lizzie called nance o'neill daphne and nance o'neill called lizzie lisbeth if lizzie had her name legally changed to lisbeth after knowing nance o'neill well then nance o'neill meant a lot to her if she would go that far as to literally change her name from how she was so christened, as she said at the uh, yeah. <laughs> at the inquest. <laughs> um, now, Nance O'Neill was having a lot of litigation with her creditors and her management, and Lizzie attended the court proceedings in Boston. So she, um, there was trouble there on the finance front, and Lizzie Borden heaping a lot of gifts and flowers and parties and orchestras and palm trees. Well, and it's interesting that Lizzie would go into a courtroom again in support of her friend. He would say, I mean, if, if I was Lizzie Borden, I would not be eager to be, you know, even if it wasn't the same courtroom. I, I think that would be very uncomfortable. Yeah, if, like if I was friends with O.J. Simpson and I had to go to court, I wouldn't want him showing up. At the yeah. <laughs> now, there, there was hints that all was not well in their relationship, that the Nance O'Neill theater troupe saw Lizzie Borden as a source of money. She was like a, a vulnerable, rich outsider, and uh, they could have seen her as someone to hit up for money. As a matter of fact, there's a small claim so suit where Lizzie tried to get some money back from one of Nance's actors. So make of this what you will. It could be, you know, 
one thing when we're dealing with who was Lizzie Borden and what's her relationship to Nance O'Neill and what happened in Tilden Thurber and everything, why did Emma leave Maplecroft? I bet if you took a lot of our lives, common people, you know, anybody that we know ourselves, and and we took away certain, we destroyed certain documents, we left certain things yeah. unexplained. We can make a big big mystery out of parts of our lives. Where, yeah, the mystery here is simply that we don't have enough information. We just don't know. And all, all it would have taken was maybe a bunch of private letters that would make it into something very mundane. But it, it does have a tinge of romance to it, you know, and that this great tragic actress is friends with this... Uh, Living tragedy. <laughs> <laughs> Unresolved. Yeah, Lizzie Borden is the type of, type of woman that Nance O'Neill would have played on the stage. Yeah, yeah. So much has been made of this relationship, but, you know, sometimes it just seems like Lizzie was trying to break out of her social isolation and have some sort of normal life. She loved the theater. I'm sure this was a big blast for her, making, inviting theatricals into her home and being friends with them and helping them out. And, you know, so it may have ended badly with people saying, hey, you still owe me money. But, you know, this was a big thing for Lizzie. She suddenly had friends and she suddenly had people who liked her. Well, she couldn't throw a party like that with, I mean, she couldn't like call up her friends and, and assemble a group like that. She almost had to import a, a, a solid block of people like, like the cast of a play and then she could have a party. Yeah. But she couldn't send out invitations and expect people to show up on French Street for just, you know, a pleasant evening at Lizzie Borden's house. That would never happen. Yeah, inv- invite the fruit and flower mission over for an afternoon tea. <laughs> yeah, not, <laughs> not available to her. It would have been interesting if she had a book club. <laughs> if they got together and read uh, uh, He Knew He Was Right by Andrew Trollope. I, what is that? There's a book in her collection called With Edged Tools that just, I mean, you, you have to laugh every time you see it on the shelf. I'm like, yeah, let's, let's make that the first collection of the Lizzie Borden book club <laughs> with edged tools. <laughs> okay, Sarah, we have to take a break now. We've been talking to Sarah Miller, the author of The Borden Murders, Lizzie Borden and the Trial of the Century, available from Random House Children's Books and Amazon.com. We'll return after this word from Nine Muses Books. Nine Muses Books is proud to sponsor the Lizzie Borden Podcast. Nine Muses Books is an independent press featuring the Lizzie Borden Girl Detective Mystery Series written by author Richard Behrens. These well-crafted comic mysteries set a fictionalized Lizzie as a teenage detective against a real Victorian-era Fall River, Massachusetts. The characters are remarkably vivid. The narrative is intellectually stimulating. And as one critic has described it, author Richard Behrens really knows how to toss delightfully deceptive literary curveballs that keep the reader mystified until just that penultimate perfect moment. Michael Martins of the Fall River Historical Society has called these stories a must-read for all those intrigued by Fall River history, mystery, and of course, Lizzie Borden. Shelley Diesick of the Lizzie Borden Warps and Wefts blog has written that the Lizzie Borden Girl Detective series are so much fun, it's nearly criminal. The Lizzie Borden Girl Detective mysteries can be found on Amazon in ebook format, and most books are offered as free downloads. In addition to these short stories, there is also the full-length novel The Minuscule Monk, offered in both print book and ebook formats. For more information, go to LizzieBordenGirlDetective.com and sign up for our newsletter. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Pinterest, and listen to our podcasts on iTunes. Visit the Garden Bay Films channel on YouTube to see special visual editions of our podcasts, as well as the Lizzie Mini series. And now, back to the Lizzie Borden Podcast. Okay, we're back with the Lizzie Borden Podcast, the Lizzie Borden Primer Part 4. We're talking to Sarah Miller, the author of The Borden Murders, Lizzie Borden and the Trial of the Century. So we're heading up towards uh, Emma leaving Maplecroft. Now, here are the factors, the theories of what could have gone in. One, One theory which most people dismiss is that Emma found out that Lizzie had murdered Andrew Borden and Abby Borden. Um, that, that I find implausible. I think Emma would have reacted. She still would have left her and never spoke to her again, but I think she would have behaved differently. I would argue that if Emma knew that information, she knew that information much sooner than 1903. I tend to believe that that's not an option to fully explain why Emma left. Entertaining theatricals in her home and Nance O'Neill, that's likely. As you said, it might have been the last straw. Nance O'Neill claimed that she had never met Emma Borden. So did Emma go upstairs? Did Emma 
to go out of the house when that was going on? Was Nance O'Neill just making stuff up? I, I don't know. Emma could have been in Fairhaven. That's true. She was still friends with the people over there. So it could have been the last straw. I doubt if it was the full reason. Another thing is that Emma was talking to the Reverend Buck a few years earlier. Uh, the party with Nance O'Neill, I think, was 1904. Reverend Buck died in 1903. And Emma yeah. said that she consulted with the Reverend Buck about why she was unhappy living at Maplecroft. So that was earlier than Reverend Buck's death. And he advised her to leave. He advised her to leave long before he Nance O'Neill. He advised her to leave well before, yeah, Nance O'Neill came into the picture. So Emma was unhappy for some reason at Maplecroft. I, that that seems to be as near to a fact as, as we're likely to get. Yeah. Another, another possibility that, that's a piece of the puzzle is that Lizzie was buying up a lot of real estate on French Street. She, bought, she was buying the houses next door, houses across the street. She was buying up all these lots. As a matter of fact, one, lot, one house, she uh, turned it into an empty lot where she put her, her automobile garage. Emma could have had a big problem with this, that Lizzie was kind of compulsively buying houses around her to cocoon herself, that she maybe wanted to like create a, a Borden compound. And Emma might have seen this as like either paranoid or, or a big waste of money or who knows. That's why people that we know who live in some of those houses today, they say, I'm living in Lizzie Borden's house. Because, you know, literally Lizzie <laughs> Borden had bought the house. Had owned it, yeah. Yeah, one house she gave to her servants to live in. Uh, one other uh, thing that came out in Parallel Lives that could have been a source of irritation for Emma, if not downright disgust, was Joseph Tatro. Yep. Joseph Tatro. He was the coachman, and he he had been a hairdresser on Second Street. That's how he started his career. Can you go, oh, Second Street, huh? <laughs> yeah. I've seen it phrased as hairdresser. I've seen it as barber. But he he was a bit of a rake. Yeah, there's something in the paper about him being popular with the ladies. I think that's literally all they say, is that he was known to have been popular with the ladies. I'm like, okay, so. Well, also going to court on an adultery charge. Well, yes, there's that. <laughs> yeah, so he was a bit of a rake. He probably yeah. you know, wore his hat tilted at an angle. and Heavens. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, well, and, and Emma didn't like Joseph Tatro, and Lizzie did. That is clear, yes. yes. And at one point, Lizzie let him go, and she, she terminated his employment. Wasn't that quite close to Emma's um, consultation with Reverend Buck? Yes. In the chronology, it, it seems like that might have been a cause and effect. Emma went and spoke to Reverend Buck. He advised her to leave. She comes back and perhaps says, to me, you're the coachman. And suddenly, yeah, the coachman's out on the street. I vote for this. I vote for the Joseph Tatro theory that this was the major reason. The Nance O'Neill yeah. thing might have been the, the twist of the knife, but um, the Joseph Tatro thing might have been something that was brewing over time. People have said... Off the record, uh, everyone knew about him and Lizzie. You know, so if you listen to it one way and you listen to certain people who are testifying informally, they, they say, oh, yeah, we knew about them. It's conclusive. They were having an affair and Emma reacted to it. But people know so much about Lizzie Borden that isn't true, that it's hard to sort out what has come down correctly and what is just another thing fresh out of the rumor mill that everybody knew. Right. It's still something that can't be proven. Right. But, you know, there's that gift she she gave him. Was that an, a, some sort of onyx jewelry type of ornament with a horse head carved onto the stone? Yeah. Um, it's clear that she valued him in some capacity, right. whether strictly as a coachman. I mean, that is a that horse carving aligns with that. It would be a thoughtful gift if, if you did appreciate your coachman very much or... It could mean more than that. And we're not going to know that. Yeah, unless the Tatro family comes up with something, which is highly unlikely. She was generous toward people she was fond of and or valued their service. Yeah, I'm buy, you know, buying houses for them to live in. That says a lot. Either way, Emma left. And from 1905 to the end of her life in 1927, the Borden sisters never spoke again. If they had spoken, we don't know about it. It's off the record. There's certainly no correspondence. There's certainly no 
evidence that they had that they spoke to each other. We're not aware of them visiting in person. They definitely continued to own real estate together and do business transactions, but through Charles Cook and through lawyers. But yeah, no evidence that they spoke. Uh, I tend to think that they might have, but it would have been very secret and there's no reason why there should be any record of it. It must have been very awkward and informal. But either way, uh, Emma went off to live first in Providence and finally ending her days in New Hampshire, near Portsmouth, near the coast, which is odd because you see a photograph of where Emma was living in Newmarket when she passed away. And it looks like, uh, from our perspective, it looks like a modern day apartment building or an apartment built. When I say modern day, the, the way apartment buildings looked when I was a kid, at least, you know, 50 years ago. But certainly she did not pass away surrounded by Victorian splendor, like Ma- Maple <laughs> No, but she still had a good deal of money, I believe. It, it, it's interesting. It, it makes me wonder, was it really, did it really just boil down to a fundamental difference in, in temperament and personality between those two women? Because I, I don't think it takes much imagination to think that Lizzie Borden might not have been easy to live with. Yeah, it's not it's not unfair to think that you'd want to spend your life living your own life away from your sister. You yeah. don't want to live with your sister your entire life. I mean, she lived with Lizzie well, until so she intimate. was. How old was Emma when she moved out of Maplecroft? If she died in, she was in her seventies when she died. When she died. Uh, she was 27. probably what late fifties or so, early. It was twenty two. Yeah, yeah. She finally moved away from her family in her fifties. And uh, that would have been a big change for her. It would have been a delayed liberation after the father died. You know, the father died. Well, yeah, she'd made that promise to her mother to look after baby Lizzie. Maybe it just finally came to her that baby Lizzie's going to be just fine. Yeah. And baby Lizzie likes different things, you know, than I do. And and just let her let her live her life without having my wings over her. Yeah. And Emma uh, gave an interview to the Boston Globe in 1913. And she she repeated her vow in her own way, even though she has no contact with her sister. In her own way, she's still looking out for her. Because she continues to insist that Lizzie is innocent. Yes, yes, which says a lot. I, I think she refers to conditions in the house becoming unbearable, that she was mm-hmm. in conference with Reverend Buck about this. Conditions in the house that might have been the Joseph Tatro. Well, and, you know, given his reputation, could he have made advances toward Emma that she found unwelcome? Could he have been inviting women up to his quarters? That's interesting. For what they considered inappropriate, she considered an inappropriate relationship. It, it doesn't have to be just him and Lizzie. There's, if he's a ladies' man, there can be many options that she might have found distasteful. Right. I never thought of that before, but you're absolutely right. Well, after Emma leaving, we now have Lizzie alone, and she'll be surrounded by friends and and servants uh, for the rest of her life. But, you know, family-wise, she's now alone, and she's living in this house on Friend Street. She now gives it a new name. Now, it wasn't unprecedented for people in Fall River to give names to their houses, uh, like Breezy Knoll, Hillcrest, The Mooring, you know, these were the and uh, Interlochen, Spencer Borden's house. But the difference was that it was mostly people of great import, like Spencer Borden. He had uh, his house Interlochen. It had orchards, it had luge lawns, it had tennis courts, horse stables, golf links. I mean, this was a stately manor, something that Lizzie could never accomplish with Maplecroft. I mean, you look at pictures of Interlochen. And it looks like some of those huge hotels in the White Mountains that was clearly, you know, we're we're getting into Citizen Kane territory at this point. (laughs) But uh, Lizzie renames her house Maplecroft, which some people consider to be pretentious, considering her ranking in the town. And I suspect there was some resentment that, I mean, I, I feel like Fall River wanted her to just be quiet. And for the most part, Lizzie Lizzie agreed, and she wanted to be quiet. You know, there's stories of her sort of retreating into her home even further than normal when the, the anniversary articles would appear in the Globe. But to to carve that name, Maplecroft, on the front step of her house is, is a little bit kind of, you know, look at me. And people did not appreciate that. Yeah, they didn't see her in the same category as Mrs. Astor from New York. No. And she wasn't. I mean, that's, that's, they're correct. But I I think there's also that level of just, you know, shh, Lizzie, don't. (laughs) Right. There's a quote from Lizzie herself who describes her life at that time. 
And she said, I spend much time on the piazza in my steamer chair, reading and building castles in the air, which is a poignant quote. There's a great photograph in Parallel Lives of Lizzie sitting in her chair on the back porch of Maplecroft, and she has on her lap Laddie Miller, one of her Boston Terriers, and it's a great domestic photograph. It's the last thing you expect to see of Lizzie Borden. Is I mean, she she looks like you know the the little old grandma from Central Casting. She's just little plump, white haired, white dress, brushing her shoe tops. Yeah, she looks like the sweetest little lady, patting the bottom of her little puppy dog. You know. Yeah, it it shows affection, it shows nostalgia, it shows grace, and it's it's one of the best photographs of her. It's also one of the few photographs we have where we see her full body, uh, as opposed to just from the shoulders up in a portrait. There are those photos of her on a picnic that are later on uh, where she looks much older, but the one on the back porch of Maplecroft, I think, is the best photograph of her. Well, and that was taken by a professional. That was... I mean, it was composed and it was deliberate, but that's, I, I argue, that's how she wanted to be seen. She sent that photograph to friends, and, and that was the image of herself that, that she approved of and, and wanted to project. Yeah, and it's amazing that the general public did not see that photo until about 2010, and we're assured that there are other photos of her that are equally striking that are just not approved for release for whatever reason. They, the people who have those photos are, are very protective of her. There, there's a very deep loyalty toward the Miss Borden that they knew versus the, the Lizzie Borden that, you know, we have bobbleheads of. Right, exactly. And uh, she she did leave kind of an interesting life in there. I mean, between her travels and going to the theater, she had a big library and she had works by the great 19th century romance novelists like Sir Walter Scott Charles Dickens, William Makepeace Thackeray. She had European tour guides. She had poetry. She had popular works, too. There's there's one, I think it's called The Rosary. Yeah. But, I mean, apparently everybody at that time from, say, literally Helen Keller to the last czar of Russia's daughters were reading at the turn of the century. Oh, and those are two people you wrote books about. I know, and they all read The Rosary. It's crazy. <laughs> all roads lead to Lizzie. <laughs> <laughs> Did the Dion sisters read the rosary? I don't know. I'll have to find out. <laughs> she also had a collection of spoons. I was amused to find out that in the early 1900s, there was a souvenir spoon mania that, that swept the country, especially among upper middle class women. And these were commemorative spoons and souvenir spoons that you could buy to complete collections uh, with various historical figures and important places embossed upon them. Lizzie had a Midnight Ride of Paul Revere spoon. <laughs> she had a Shakespeare's Birthplace and Stratford-upon-Avon spoon. Sadly, she didn't last long enough to get the complete set of the Dion Quintuplet spoon. But, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that craze kind of lingered on throughout the century, the early years, because, you know, in the 30s, it was it was still a thing. I guess it's sort of like the Victorian woman's equivalent to the uh, Cabbage Patch doll phenomenon. <laughs> yeah, Lizzie loved her spoons as well. And another thing that we found in Parallel Lives that I didn't know before, Lizzie had a companion for a few years. Her name was Gertrude May Russell, and Lizzie called her Trudy. And this was a young girl who had worked in the mills. Her mother had run a boarding house, and she lived with Lizzie on the third floor of Maplecroft. And she would attend the theater with Lizzie. She'd dine with her in restaurants. They'd go to museums together. They traveled to New York, Boston, Washington. She would sit with Lizzie and read her books. Can you imagine, like, having been a mill girl and then going to Maplecroft, a place like Maplecroft, and then Maplecroft specifically? To, I mean, when you think of this young girl who offered this, this employment, what goes through your mind when you think, well, this is a big opportunity for change. It's Lizzie Borden, folks. Yeah, could you imagine if Trudy had written some sort of memoir that we'd know so much more? Now, she had left Lizzie's employee by 1913 because she got married, and she went to work in, Mc, in McWhirr's department store in South Main Street as a clerk. But yeah, what a gig. What a gig. She wasn't hired to clean her house or to do scullery maid work. She was hired to dine in fine restaurants and go to the theater. So I also thought, you know, Lizzie, at the time Emma left Maplecroft, this was around the time of the great explosion of Nickelodeon movie theaters. And whether Lizzie had like gone to see The Great Train Robbery or gone to see you know any of D.W. Griffith's. Do you know, just backtracking a little bit, I started reading 
a, a D.W. Griffith biography because one of my other passions is silent film. And yes, I, I do have interest outside of Lizzie Borden. <laughs> Full confessional here. But I was reading a biography of D.W. Griffith and I nearly jumped out of my chair and hit the ceiling. In 1905, D.W. Griffith was an actor. He was a stage actor. And he joined the theatrical troupe of Nance O'Neill. <laughs> Holy isn't that, cat. Isn't that incredible? That's crazy. Yeah. He missed Lizzie Borden by about six months. <laughs> but but how cool is that? Yeah, D.W. Griffith wild. was started his career acting on the Broadway stage with Nance O'Neill. A part of me wish, likes to think that he got in there about six months earlier and he was at that party at Maplecroft. <laughs> And then he, kept, he probably would have made a movie about it. <laughs> yeah, he kept in touch with Lizzie. And, and somewhere <laughs> somewhere in the movie Intolerance, especially in the Babylon scene, where all the <laughs> slave girls are and the Queen of Babylon is up on the big elephant, somewhere in that, Lizzie, like, as a joke, like, played an extra. <laughs> <laughs> we can hope. <laughs> so... Lizzie in the movies, this is uncharted territory. We don't know anything yeah, about it. Yeah, we, we don't know. We, we don't, don't know. know. We don't know if she ever set foot in a Nickelodeon, if she ever saw a Charlie Chaplin movie or... I wouldn't be shocked if she had yeah. something she might have been interested in. She spent the last 10 years of her life with Charlie Chaplin being the most famous film star in Hollywood. So it's possible. You never know. She might have had screenings in her home, but uh, not a shred of evidence... Yeah, not a shred no. of evidence to any of this. Or she might have been so 19th century that movies just didn't hold any appeal to her. Yeah, I don't know if how, how curious she would be about I mean, I I could imagine that just straight up curiosity she might have once gone to see what's what's it all about. Yeah. Um, whether or not it appealed to her or not. Right. Who knows? Well, she lived long enough for silent film to mature out of the Nickelodeon era into some pretty sophisticated films. When did Nance O'Neill make the shift into film? Could could Lizzie then have seen Nance O'Neill on film? film? Well, uh, I don't have the exact year in front of me, but do you know who Nance O'Neill worked for as a director in film? Mm -hmm. D.W. Griffith. <laughs> of course. Yeah. <laughs> she was in, in D.W. Griffith movies. I know. There's there, uh, again. All roads lead back to Lizzie, <laughs> uh, even though we have no evidence. You know, Lizzie had any film connections or contact with Griffith. But yeah, D.W. Griffith made a couple of movies with Nance O'Neill as the star. His old boss. He was working with his old theater boss. Yeah. But Lizzie lived into the jazz age. She saw Prohibition. She saw gangsters. She saw flappers. She saw jazz dancing, women's suffrage, motion pictures, electricity, automobiles. This was very different from the, you know, the 1860 that she was born into. She also saw the decline of the textile industry in Fall River uh, with the competition with the Southern Mills. So a lot of change was going on. Airplanes. Was Lizzie Borden ever in an airplane? <laughs> We'll never know. Of course, people writing alternative history novels like myself, you know, may do that, may put her into. Right. She liked to travel down to, uh, you know, where the Wright brothers were performing their Kitty Hawk experiments in the Carolinas. <laughs> and she may have one day seen these guys with this big uh, contraption flying machine over on the field. And she said, what's this? Let me let me give it a whirl. <laughs> 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 and she may have been the first female aviator. Yeah, we like to dream about these things. In her last years, one thing I find interesting about her last years is that she spent so much time down in Washington, D.C. And we know the name of the hotel that she would stay at. She was friends with Grace Hartley Howe, a woman who grew up in Fall River, who married Louis McHenry Howe, who became part of the whole Franklin Roosevelt phenomenon. He became, when Roosevelt became president, Louis Howe became his secretary. And he had kind of been the mastermind behind Roosevelt's campaigns to become president. So Lizzie was kind of connected that way through her friend Grace. And Louis McHenry Howe knew Lizzie Borden very well through his wife. Two of them would come back to Fall River, Grace's hometown. And in fact, the two of them are buried there in Oak Grove Cemetery. But Lizzie dies in 1927. Just a handful of years later, Roosevelt enters the White House with Louis McHenry Howe at his side. 
if Lizzie had not died at the time she did, she would have been best friends with a, with a woman who, who lived in the White House because the house lived in the Lincoln bedroom. Blow your mind, doesn't it? She was pretty well connected, even, even as a pariah. Yeah, we don't know exactly. I mean, as far as we know, when she went to Washington, she would socialize, she'd go to the theater. But it's pretty mind-boggling to think that she was just a couple of degrees separated from the president of the United States, or yeah. at least the man who it's would be. It's a very small degree of separation, if there was any at all. Yeah. Unfortunately, her health was declining by 1925, and people who knew her said that she was losing considerable flesh. Her hair was turning gray, which I, I guess was natural, but I mean, she wasn't in very good health. But I mean, her father lived to be, well, you know, but I mean, at, at 70, he was not a frail old man. He was considered elderly, but he didn't, you know, seem to be really on the wane, where it, it, it seems to me that it's very likely that stress played a pretty significant role in Lizzie Borden's longevity. Yeah, she had all sorts of health problems at this point. And she went in for a surgical procedure into Truesdale Hospital under the name Mary Smith Borden. Uh, some say she had a gallbladder operation, but her health never recovered from this. There's an incident when she's in the hospital. Her was it her doctor had himself just um, his wife had just had a baby while Lizzie was in the hospital, and she happened to mention, you know, he came up to, to see her, to examine her, and mentioned that, you know, his wife had just had another daughter, and Lizzie mentions that she's never held a newborn. So the man goes down and, and brings his newborn daughter up for Lizzie Borden to hold. Yeah, very poignant. Yeah, when you're used to seeing her as a, a crazy axe murderer, it's hard to put those images into your head alongside that. I can imagine a lot of people over the years not trusting her to hold their, their children. Yeah. That's very tragic. Of course, if she if we could prove her innocence, it would seem even more tragic to us that she spent the second half of her life half living it. There was a great basis for a life there, and I'm sure she enjoyed it to the extent that she could. Right, but she was pretty limited to just kind of skulking around, really, and trying not to be seen. Yeah, traveling under assumed names and having everything she do be a scandal in the newspaper. And the one of the last things that she did, this was on her deathbed in 1927. Her health had deteriorated to the point where she was dying. Her chauffeur at the time, Ernst Terry, a man who she had a great relationship with. Uh, the man had a family. He had children. All the children saw her as Auntie Borden. Auntie Borden, yeah. There's that series of picnic photographs of Lizzie out on a picnic with um, the Terry family, and they're they're having a lot of fun. She would dote on these children, give them birthday cards, holiday cards. Sent by special delivery because she, I mean, even sending something to the mail, she couldn't really do with little stickers on them. And yeah, give them a lot of toys and gifts. One of the last things she did on her deathbed was give Ernst Terry a blank check to fix his house. He wrote out the check for $2,500. That was one of the last things she did. Of course, she didn't even care like how much money he was going to spend. She tr It didn't matter. She trusted him. And she died of what was said on her death certificate as myocarditis or, or myocarditis, acute, yeah. acute bronchitis. Her funeral was on June 4th, 1927 at 12 noon. The service was at Maplecroft. At Lizzie's instructions, they read Tennyson's Crossing the Bar, the 14th chapter of St. John, the 23rd Psalm, and the first and fourth verses of My Ain Country, a Scottish song. Lizzie loved Scottish things. She named her dogs like Laddie Miller, you know, after Scottish names. She had My Ain Country embossed upon one of her fireplaces. And do we know if, if she did that herself or if that was something that was in place and, and that's how she came across that poem or, the, or song? Well, she has two fireplaces that have inscriptions on them. And mm -hmm. one is the poem that ends with my fire, when my fires burn low. The other yeah. is the, uh, the embossment of, of my own country. Of course, over the years, people have said, well, Lizzie is trying to give us a cryptic message and she's trying right. to tell us something. Or if you, if you turn it into numerology, you might be able to get the true name <laughs> of the murderer, you know, who, who killed her parents. Well, and there, there is a verse in my own country in the, in the song about, gosh, I don't remember exactly how it goes, but it's, it's basically saying I'll be washed clean of my sins and I'll be greeted by my father, which, given the context, is, you go, wow, yikes. But when you actually look, if you look at a piece of music in a songbook from the era, you see that the verses she chose, the first and the fourth, don't include that part. 
in regard to the fireplace, the inscription on the mantle, when people bought homes of that stature in Fall River, how did they furnish it? And there were a lot of dealers and warehouses and showrooms where they would just sell custom furniture that that's just pretty much from the mass market. Here's a fireplace, and we got like 20 of them that say my own country. <laughs> Lizzie might have seen one of them in a showroom and said, well, I like Scottish things, and that reminds me yeah. of Robert Burns right. or something. It could be something totally mundane is that she saw it and she liked it, and she brought it home. But, I mean, it's, it's obvious that it eventually acquired significant meaning for her. How how it happened, we won't know, but obviously there's a link there. Yeah, and the mantelpiece poem that ends with When My Fires Burn Low, you know, that's a, a fireplace poem. You know, it didn't have to be anything personal. Yeah, it's like someone having a, a plate on their wall that says home sweet home. It's just something that people get that's like a standard cookie cutter thing that, that you decorate your home with. The phenomenon that happens over and over again is because we have so little information that everything we can find, we want to have significance. Uh, so she goes to her grave and at her own instruction, she's laid at her father's feet. There's a small headstone that says Lizbeth next to Emma, next to Alice, the sister who, who didn't live, and next to Abby and Andrew. Also buried on the plot is uh, Andrew's first wife, Lizzie's biological mother. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, Emma is laid at her mother's feet and, and Lizzie at her father's. Yes. She wanted the grave to be brick because she didn't want, you know, there was that tendency of graves to collapse and, and fall deeper into the earth. And very poignantly, she wrote towards the end of her life, I would give every cent I have in the world and beg in the streets, if it could only be proved while I live, that I did not kill my father and stepmother. And we can only hope that that's true, for her sake. Unfortunately, it was not proved, so doubts linger to this day. But she had a couple of more things to reveal about her private life, which was in her will. And if you could tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, her will is interesting because you, you kind of get a glimpse of things that are important to her. I mean, the very first item on on this list here is to the city of Fall River, the sum of $500, the income derived therefrom to be used for the perpetual care of my father's lot in the Oak Grove Cemetery. So that, that upkeep of, of the plot in general, and, you know, she, she mentions that it's her father's lot and wanting to be buried at her father's feet, and you, you can't help wondering, what is that about? Is it, again, is it guilt or is it affection and, and sorrow and grief? You can't know those things, but there it is right at the top of the list. You find that she valued her servant to her housekeeper and each one of the servants who have who have been with me for five years and are still employed at the time of her death, the sum of $3,000 each. Charles Cook was important to her. The big one is the Animal Rescue League, League of Fall River, $30,000. Now, I mean, I can, I can imagine, you know, local humane societies who would be thrilled in 2016 to receive $30,000. <laughs> right. We're talking almost 100 years ago. That, that was a tremendous sum. If Andrew Borden's estate was valued at, at 300000 and that was $60 million in 1996 dollars, $3,000 would have been a lot as well. As a matter of fact, you're right about the Animal Rescue League because I, I went there recently, just last year. We, uh, the mud needers in Fall River, went to visit. <laughs> to this day in the lobby, they have framed pictures of Lizzie and Emma. I've heard that. I, I'm glad that it's true. Yeah. You know, standard portraits that we're very familiar with, but they, they still speak very highly there. They were their first benefactors. They actually got the business off the ground and, and turned it into a viable enterprise. The, the other thing you learned from her will is that she did have friends that, that were important to her because there are a number of people listed. And again, they're receiving thousands of dollars, a thousand here, 5,000 there, $2,000. Two people, Miss Helen Layton, you see here, she also, it, it, it again confirmed she had expensive taste. She liked fine things to this. Miss Helen Layton, she gives my three diamond rings and diamond and sapphire brooch, uh, her inlaid mahogany desk and chairs. And also gave her first choice of her rugs, books, china, etc. You know, that, that she may choose to her cousin Grace Howe. Again, another diamond and amethyst ring, and second choice of all the rugs, books, china, pictures, furniture, and and then at the end, oh, and the Animal Rescue League of Washington D.C. received two thousand dollars. I'd forgotten that. Oh yeah. The chauffeur's family, and the daughter of the chauffeur, two thousand dollars. Wife of the chauffeur, two thousand dollars. Ernest Terry. Yeah. Yeah, anyone who appeared in the picnic photographs got two thousand dollars. Yeah, pretty much, including um, the dog. And then you also you see that very hard line Borden's firmness and fairness comes out. 
Um, number 28 here, I have not given my sister Emma L. Borden anything, as she had her share of her father's estate and is supposed to have enough to make her comfortable. And I read that as it is supposed, it is presumed that she had enough, which, and that is just perfectly fair. It, it strikes us a little funny, but I mean, that's, that's probably something that she, that's an, a way that she took after her father. He was just to the letter. Now, Lizzie left no children. Emma left no children. Emma died a little more than a week after Lizzie. Yeah, it was like 10 days or less after Lizzie. And they were both buried together in Oak Grove Cemetery. You could visit them to this day. If you go in through the main gate of the cemetery, as soon as you enter, there are these big honking arrows painted on the ground. Mm -hmm. You can see them on the Google Maps. Yeah, (laughs) just follow the arrows and it would take you to the right to the plot. Uh, There's other people buried in the cemetery that are of note to people who are very serious about discovering Fall River's past, Lizzie Borden and her sister Emma's life. Members of the Borden family that we've been talking about, the extended family, the, um, I think I was there once with Shelley when we found Ernest Terry's grave. Between that and several other cemeteries in the area, uh, some in Fall River, some slightly out, you could find the graves of Dr. Bowen, Marshall Hilliard, Andrew Jennings, uh, Hosea Knowlton, The list goes on. You could find all these people. You could even find the grave of the man who had the ice cream vending right outside the house. (laughs) Lubinsky? Lubinsky. Hyman Lubinsky. Hyman Lubinsky. Yeah, you could. uh, We even found his grave once. Shelley's big on finding graves. Yeah. There's a funny little stone I ran across. I had to take a picture of it because it it says Lizzie and it's cockeyed and it's got this creepy little moss thing growing on it and it it looks like what you expect lizzie borden's gravestone to look like and it's not her of course (laughs) it's not her it's like the perfect embodiment of the lizzie borden legend versus the actual very plain little lisbeth stone that is yeah it's a halloween grave from the opening credits of a tim burden movie somebody should cast that thing in styrofoam and spray paint it in a marble color and they could make money yeah so We've come to the end of the Lizzie Borden primer. We've come to the end of telling you the story of Lizzie Borden's life, her uh, life and times and trials and death. In future broadcasts, we're going to go over some of the incidents in her life in greater detail. We can go on endlessly. There could be hundreds of episodes based around zeroing in on things like the life of Nance O'Neill and all we know about that relationship. We could have endless episodes about the trial. As time goes on, I'll, I'll discover how to do this in, a, in, in an efficient way that will keep the audience entertained. But for now, we have to lay it to rest, move on. And I hope that when your Dion Quintuplet booklets come out, you can come back and talk to us about it. Heck yeah. Yeah. You know where to find me. <laughs> yeah. Sarah, I want to thank you so much for your contribution to the Lizzie Borden podcast and for your contribution to Lizzie Borden studies in general with your wonderful book, The Borden Murders, Lizzie Borden and the Trial of the Century. Oh, thank you. I'm, I'm glad to do it. It's, it's, it's fun to talk Borden with, you know, like-minded nerds. So <laughs> I'm game anytime. <laughs> yeah. Well, the world needed some grounded Borden nerds who are kind of Sticking to, <laughs> sticking to history and sticking to facts and being honest about what we know. Oh, yeah, I mean, yeah, we need detectives, sure, because maybe, maybe someday somebody will find that little thread and unravel it. But yeah. in the meantime, just, just the facts, man. Anybody out there who has the actual murder weapon, please contact us <laughs> at Lizzie Borden, girl detective at gmail.com. <laughs> so uh, that would be nice. It would be nice to solve it, but don't hold your breath. You'll turn blue and fall over. (laughs) 125 years later, we have like no new evidence. So the best we could do is just try to dig more and more into Lizzie Borden as a person, look at her life and try to find as much as we can without violating anyone's sense of privacy or because there's a lot that should remain private. There's a lot of Lizzie Borden stuff out there that apparently is in private hands And it's probably best that it remains in private hands. We don't have to know every minutia about everything she did and said. No, and I I think that their their sort of prevailing attitude among those people whose families knew her personally is strikes me as until the the public perception of her changes, we don't deserve those things. That information or the photographs or, you know, 
to look at those those gifts, those objects that they own that, that were given to them by somebody who was very special to them. Yeah, and TV shows depicting her as a sadistic serial killer, they don't help. Yeah. They probably make them make those people go deeper into silence and privacy. Yeah. But so anyway, thank you, Sarah. You're welcome. Thank you. I've had a good time. And if you have any ideas of your own about an episode, let me know. We'll, okay. we'll arrange it. Yeah. It doesn't have to be Lizzie Borden. It could be other bizarre, eccentric, and notorious women of the time. Actually, I was thinking of, of an Annie Sullivan episode. Yeah, because there's some, there's some sordid past in there with her experience in the, the almshouse and yeah. Massachusetts history. That was, I mean, that was a big scandal when the Tewksbury thing was, you know, hit the papers and the, the court proceedings and whatnot over that, the conditions there. We'll try to set a date for that. Yeah, I'll have to read up a little bit. It's been a while. <laughs> Oop, there's the bell. <laughs> Ding. Game over. <laughs> okay. All right. We'll talk to you next time. Thanks a lot. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Thanks for joining us on the Lizzie Borden Podcast. We'll be back next time with an interview with Michael Mardens and Dennis Bennett of the Fall River Historical Society, discussing their book, Parallel Lives, A Social History of Lizzie A. Borden and Her Fall River. Thanks for joining us. This podcast was produced by Nine Muses Books and engineered by Mason Amadeus. The theme music was composed and performed by Melora Krieger. The Lizzie Borden Podcast is sponsored by Nine Muses Books and the Lizzie Borden Girl Detective Mystery Series. More information can be found at lizzybordenpodcast.com and lizzybordengirldetective.com. <laughs>